morning for everyone in Australia and good evening to all our friends in Brazil. Welcome to the Australia Brazil Alumni Leadership Conference, co-hosted by the Embassy of Australia in Brazil and the Australian National University. We've had a fantastic time last week and I foresee another series of great talks this week for you to support your professional development. Before we start, I would like to begin our session with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and we pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. A Embaixada da Austrália no Brasil apresenta essa série de webinars 2020 em parceria com a Australian National University, a universidade número um do país de acordo com o ranking QS. Esta semana e semana que vem, a ANU vai trazer especialistas renomados mundialmente para apresentações que vão apoiar o seu desenvolvimento profissional. Meu nome é Ana Paula, e, like you, I'm part of the Brazilian alumni community. I'm a former student of the ANU. Currently, I'm the regional manager for Brazil in the marketing and recruitment division of the university, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's session. I'd just like to mention a few housekeeping rules to our guests. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and may be broadcasted on ANU TV and YouTube. We encourage everyone's participation. Your cameras and microphones have been disabled on entry, but there are several ways you can interact with us. If you would wish to ask a question or speak, please use the raise your hand function on Zoom and we will unmute you. We can also enable your video. You can use the Q&A function to pose any questions, there is a button on the lower part of your screen that you can just click and send your question to us. If you just want to make a comment on what you're watching today, you can use the chat function. After the panelists deliver their presentations, we are going to invite one of our attendees to share their experience in Australia with us. But I would like to invite Nick Johnson, Director of International Strategy and Partnerships at the Australian National University, to say a few words to us. Boa noite, Brasil. Good morning, Canberra and Sydney. Um, it's a great honor to be here today. Um, and I really welcome the initiative by the Australian Embassy in Brazil to partner with ANU in delivering this seminar series. I'm Nick Johnson. I'm the International Director at the University. But I did work at the embassy uh, a few years ago, and I have worked with both Ambassador Kane and uh, Professor uh, Campbell in, in the field in the promoting the education relationship between um, Australia and Brazil. And it's actually my and my team back in 2016 that initiated this uh, alumni forum. So I'm very pleased to see it's in its fifth year now, and I've had another opportunity to uh, to to uh, participate. And I do uh, recognize quite a few names from the participant list. So if, you, if I've seen you before, I can't look at you right now. Uh, great to catch up again. So, so I'm really looking forward to this today and uh, I'll, I'll sit back and just uh, listen to um, all the wise minds around the table and see how much I, uh, I can learn. So good luck and uh, um, back to you, Ana Paula. Thank you, Nick. And indeed, tonight we are discussing leadership and diplomacy, and we could not have better speakers. We will watch the presentations of Professor Geoffrey Wiseman, um, Professor Noel Campbell, and Ambassador Tim Kane. If you have any question for our speakers, please send it via the Q&A button on your screen. <laughs> And our first speaker of this, uh, of this evening is Professor Jeffrey Wiseman, uh, Professor and Director of the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy at the Australian National University. Uh, good morning, Professor. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly and tell us what you're going to share with our guests today? Thank you so much, Anna Paula, and welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I am a professor at the ANU at the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. Um, my background is a little varied in the sense that <clears throat> I started out in the Australian Foreign Service. Uh, in fact, I was recruited in exactly the same year as my co-panelist, Noel Campbell. Uh, so I worked uh, for 12, 13 years in the Foreign Service. And uh, then I moved and worked at the Ford Foundation in New York City. And I then subsequently moved into academia after doing a PhD. So that's my background, Anna. And I wanted to talk today uh, about this, the general concept of leadership and diplomacy, 
<clears throat> and my comments are, are based, uh, if I may uh, sort of push on, uh, my comments are based on a course that I teach uh, at the undergraduate level uh, here at ANU. And the course is called Leadership and Diplomacy. And so I, I've based my talk around that uh, syllabus, the outline that I deliver for ANU undergraduates. So as you'll see from the outline uh, that has been posted, uh, screen shared, um, I, I ask four or five key questions at the start. What is leadership, types of leadership? Why do we have leaders in the first place? What are the qualities of leadership, uh, managing versus leading? And I won't go into those questions because I, I do have a strong sense that some of you will be familiar with the leadership literature, some very leading figures like James McGregor Burns, uh, Nan Cohane, uh, and various other people. And I also understand that you've had a very nice introduction to the leadership concept uh, in uh, a previous uh, webinar in this series. But uh, of course, we can come back to it later on in Q&A if you like. So my key question, uh, and I've listed that in bold, is does it make sense, is it realistic to actually talk about leadership in the context of international diplomacy? That's the question that I'm trying to address. And the reason why this is more of a puzzle or a question than you might imagine is that, in my view, there are a lot of views about what diplomacy actually is. There are also a lot of views about what leadership actually is. And so given the varied approaches to these two big ideas, diplomacy and leadership. What I'm trying to do in my course is to combine the two into a coherent concept that we can call for our purposes diplomatic leadership. And so the reason why this is a puzzle, the reason why it's a tricky issue is that the general impression is that leadership is the prerogative of political leaders. Political figures, whether they're elected or not, they're the ones who basically formulate policy, make the big decisions. Diplomats, on the other hand, in the general imagination, are meant to be bureaucrats, civil servants. They basically implement policy that is decided by political figures. And so basically, some of the political or the diplomacy theorists, such as Ivan Newman uh, in Norway, Cornelia uh, Biola at Oxford University, they remind us that diplomacy is a very tightly scripted profession. It's based on protocol, on norms, on legal standards, and on the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, amongst many other international legal arrangements. So the bottom line is that political leaders are meant to be the policy formulators and therefore the leaders. Diplomats are expected to be the policy implementers. So the question then becomes, how and under what circumstances does it make sense to speak of diplomatic leadership? So I want to tackle that question by just quickly going through 10 ways, issues or questions, how we can explore this conceptual challenge. And again, if you look at the one pager on the screen, you'll see the uh, course that I'm going to take. So the very first question I ask is, do historical writings on diplomacy shed much light on this diplomatic leadership concept. And actually they don't. Um, so that if you go to one of the most famous uh, pieces of diplomatic writing of the last hundred years, this is Harold Nicholson's The Ideal Diplomat. What Nicholson talks about is the characteristics that make up the effect of the good diplomat. And uh, some of you will be familiar with these. They are truthfulness, precision, calm, good temper, patience, modesty, and loyalty. Now in this explanation of the ideal diplomat by Harold Nicholson, there is no explicit reference to leadership. And I think the reason for this is that it was in part ingrained, it was a taken for granted concept. So that in Nicholson's day, and well before, for centuries in fact, leaders were born into a certain social class and therefore had a certain instinct, a responsibility to be the natural leaders and therefore the natural and, and the natural diplomats at the same time. Now, I think this is changing today and quite radically and in very interesting ways, but let me stick with history, um, more recent history than Nicholson, uh, and move to the early post-World War II period. And this is the second item that I've listed on uh, the outline, and that is diplomatic leadership in reporting. And here, the most famous example of someone showing leadership in 
a, a diplomatic reporting setting was George Kennan's famous long telegram of 1946. Uh, Kennan was the uh, US Deputy Chief of Mission. He was Chargé d'Affaires at the time he wrote this long telegram. And the reason why it has become, let's say, famous in foreign policy terms is that it set the, ground, the groundwork, it set out a framework for the containment policy. How was the United States, the West, going to contain the threat from the Soviet Union and the East? And so containment policy was born <clears throat> or outlined, although the term itself wasn't used, in that long telegram. Now, the reason why I mention this as a leadership uh, issue is that Kennan was the number two at the embassy. He had become, he was chargé d'affaires <clears throat> for only three or four weeks. And it was only after three or four weeks that Kennan sent his long telegram. So what's my point? That when you have a situation where you are thrust into leadership at short notice, do you take uh, the initiative? Do you take risks? Do you do something bold? And George Kennan did that <clears throat> in one of the most, I think, graphic ways imaginable. <clears throat> he wrote an 8,000 word cable um, that basically changed US foreign policy for decades. And of course, many of us are still using the term containment, although in a different context today. Now, the question to ponder here is, was George Kennan an exception? Um, and that is a, an important aspect of the leadership issue. Um, I don't think he was an exception. I think he was an extreme example of someone who took the initiative from a situation which you could call situational leadership uh, for want of a better term. Now, the third issue that I wanted to address is can we find evidence of diplomatic leadership in negotiation? Now, I think there must be hundreds, even thousands of stories in diplomatic memoirs of where people have shown leadership in, diplom in diplomatic negotiations. But I just want to mention two examples that jump out, uh, at least in my mind. <clears throat> the first one concerns Jean Kennedy Smith, who was a uh, Kennedy and was Bill Clinton's ambassador to Ireland in the 1990s. Now, as you'll know, in American diplomatic practice, diplomats can show individual leadership if they are politically appointed. Career ambassadors uh, have a different set of expectation, in my view. <clears throat> now, what Jean Kennedy Smith did, she had a very close connection with the Irish, but she was, she was accredited to the government of Ireland. The problem is that she wanted to be involved in and with the Irish Republican Army, the IRA in Northern Ireland, and the peace process. Now, the diplomatic difficulty was that Northern Ireland is a, a part of the United Kingdom and the US ambassador in London is responsible for all things to do with Northern Ireland. So Jean Smith, uh, Kennedy Smith got herself involved in that <clears throat> peace process, uh, made herself very, very unpopular, but the general uh, historical record is that even though she probably was a little bit too pushy, uh, <clears throat> she did contribute in some way to the peace process that led to the famous Good Friday Agreement of the late 1990s that George Mitchell, Senator George Mitchell, brokered. So that's arguably a good example, if you like, of diplomatic negotiation uh, revealing leadership. An arguably bad example and involving a political appointee was President Trump's appointment of um, the hotel chain owner Gordon Sondland as US ambassador to the European Union. And he, like Kennedy Smith, went outside his formal mandate in Brussels. Remember, he was the ambassador to the European Union. And he became involved in the Ukraine issue at the time, along with Rudolf Giuliani. I'm sure most of you have read about this in the last six, 12 months. And this led, in fact, to uh, Trump's impeachment inquiry. So again, the point is that you can show diplomatic leadership, but sometimes there are good examples and sometimes there are bad examples in the negotiation. Uh, aspect. The fourth point that I mentioned there is diplomatic leadership, or I asked the question, is diplomatic leadership more likely to occur in crisis situations? And I think the answer to that is probably yes. Um, and a very good example here that I would mention is Prudence Bushnell, who was the US ambassador in Nairobi, Kenya in the late 1990s. Uh, she had warned Washington DC over a couple of years about the threat or yes, security threats from Al Qaeda. Um, and wanted to uh, increase, improve the security of the embassy. 
Um, and the warnings were not heard in Washington, D.C. And as we all know, there was a, an, a bombing of the embassy in August of 1998. Hundreds of people killed, uh, thousands injured. And so this does raise the question, would it have been different? Would Bushnell's warnings to Washington, D.C. have been heard if she were a male ambassador, as opposed to being a female ambassador? Would her warnings have been heard if she were a politically appointed ambassador, as opposed to a career ambassador? These are all open-ended questions, but I think they do relate to this concept of leaders and how we see them. Now, one of the things that impresses me about the Bushnell case is that she handled the crisis itself, the tragedy, which she, in a sense, predicted. Uh, she handled it with great grace and dignity, and she avoided the temptation to say, I told you so. Um, but it does really lead to the question that I want to leave with you, which is, um, does diplomatic leadership occur only primarily in periods of crisis? I think it's more likely to occur in crisis situations, but it occurs in normal or settled situations as well. The fifth point that I mentioned there is great power diplomatic leadership. Now here, I just want to say very quickly, this is the default position. When we talk about diplomatic leadership today, we're almost always talking about the great powers. Has the United States abandoned its global leadership role? Is China the new global leader? What about the BRICS, including Brazil? Uh, are they developing new leadership strategies and the like? But again, uh, I'll just move on from that. Uh, great power diplomatic leadership is what dominates our debate about this concept. The sixth point, again, I'll just mention quickly because um, uh, we have Noel Campbell and Ambassador Kane with us, but this is the role of diplomatic leadership at middle and small powers. I would make the case that um, small and middle powers can, under certain circumstances, in certain conditions, and with the right people, um, make a, a, a tremendous difference to international diplomatic activity. And I mentioned examples such as Australia, Canada, uh, Norway, Singapore as examples. But again, this can come up in our Q&A. <clears throat> the seventh question or issue I raise is, how important is moral standing in determining diplomatic leadership? At the political level, it is no doubt important. And the best example we have of that is Nelson Mandela and the political credibility he brought to South Africa's rise in post-apartheid South Africa in the 1990s. And then you could compare the moral legacy that Mandela left and how in some respects it was, in many people's accounts, squandered by his successors. Um, I would also mention this question of does moral leadership or standing apply to individual diplomats? And here again, I think it does. So that if you come back to the Ukraine case that I mentioned a little earlier, uh, it was not only the ambassador to the EU who sort of muddied the waters on this, but Marie Yovanovitch, uh, who was the US ambassador to Ukraine, withstood enormous pressure to stay clear of US domestic politics as ambassador. And then she testified precisely to that effect uh, during the Trump impeachment uh, hearings uh, late last year. So again, my point is simply that moral standing is important for uh, the individual diplomat. Um, on eight, I asked the question, well, in a multilateral setting, are diplomatic leadership characteristics requirements different from a bilateral setting? And my own impression here is that uh, they do require different leadership skill sets, but I will leave that again uh, to Noel and Ambassador Kane to develop that theme if they show which. The ninth issue I raise is regional diplomatic leadership. And that's clearly an interesting case, not only for Australia, but also for countries such as Brazil. The classic case here is the European Union. Is it the quintessential example of regional integration, regional organization? Can we move on from the European model to start considering questions about China? What kind of regional leadership model does it present today? Um, the bottom line issue here for me is that are we moving from a world, a globalizing world, to a world of regions, as Amitabh Acharya argues? In other words, the globalized world is being now meshed with a regionalized world. And if that's the case, then the opportunities for regional diplomatic leadership for me, are uh, really quite uh, immense. And the final question I raise, uh, my 10th point, is there a place for non-state actor diplomacy in the modern world, for non-state actor leadership? And I think this relates very much to the big conceptual questions, what about, what is the future of the state? 
Now, diplomacy has traditionally for centuries been seen as the domain of states. I think that is fading, but the state is still a highly resilient political actor. Um, but at the same time, who can doubt that non-state actors such as Amnesty International, uh, the Gates Foundation, think tanks, Human Rights Watch, these are major players in international affairs. And I think it would be a very, um, let's say, dubious diplomat who ignores their impact and their relevance to the solving of world problems and challenges today. So my concluding point is that, look, all this for me, at least, these 10 ways of interrogating the question, what do we think of diplomatic leadership, is that however we define it, I think leadership does appear in diplomatic ways, in diplomacy, in many varied and different ways. Anna, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Weisman. And I just think it's incredible how you just gave us six months of knowledge in 15 minutes. <laughs> that is an incredible feat. And we do have uh, questions from the audience already. And I have a question myself, actually, that I would like to hear from you, Professor, and also from Professor Campbell and from the Ambassador. You were mentioning uh, that historically the, the, the traits of the ideal diplomat are patience, modesty, loyalty. Uh, is that still true in the contemporary world where most world leaders don't, are not showing those traits specifically? You'll see an entire different um, yeah, role of, of leaders in the, in the world. And we do have a question from the audience, which is um, regarding to different styles of leadership as well. How can those different styles of leadership sometimes interfere in an effective diplomatic negotiation? So um, if our panelists could address those questions, that would be great. Yes. Well, uh, on your question about patience. Um, look, I, I think uh, Noel uh, and I, let's say, are senior enough to remember the idea of a dispatch and a diplomatic bag, which took weeks and weeks to come um, to me, for example, in Hanoi, uh, where, which was my second diplomatic posting. Um, and so there are remnants of an era, a past era, um, that um, are being displaced now by information and communication technology. Um, and I think while things such as new technology and social media, I think they do undermine these traditional values of patience. And let's think about this. One of my former ambassadors, I remember him telling me after an annual performance review that one of the most important qualities of the diplomat is masterful in action. Now, can you imagine that advice being given to any young diplomat today? I, I doubt it uh, very much indeed. Um, so I think that gets at that particular question. Um, and the other, the other question, Anna Paola, was? The other question was about how can different styles of leadership interfere in effective diplomatic negotiations? Yes, look, I, I think this is really a, 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 a very important question. I think they can completely undercut a negotiation um, so that if you have take for example um, it's a Barack Obama and a Boris Yeltsin meeting together I mean as slightly I think it is a hypothetical example um, but you can imagine that these two characters really quite different um, in their style um, and scholars such as Cornelia Biola have have categorized different types of diplomat, at least in crisis. So there's the maverick style, uh, the person who basically goes outside the norm and is very, very keen to basically find a breakthrough solution, um, and, but doesn't quite have everyone on board. And you can imagine how well that ends up. Sometimes it works, you know, you could say, um, sometimes, occasionally, the heavy handed um, sort of approach can work. Uh, a second category that Cornelia Biola mentions is the congregator diplomat. And the example he gives is Javier Solana, the former Secretary General of NATO, uh, High Representative of the European Union, a classic uh, consensus builder, didn't have the big vision about NATO and its future, but was extremely adept at bringing all of the NATO partners, partners together and keeping them together during the Kosovo crisis of the late 1990s, when NATO could easily have split uh, on that particular issue. And then the final ex type he gives is Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, who <clears throat> Biola classifies as a pragmatist. He will basically do whatever it takes to get a deal done. And so you can imagine if you have 
um, two congregators or two pragmatists together, things are going to work out well. But if you do have a mismatch of style and approach, even national diplomatic styles, uh, but I won't go into that now, could cause something of a different, of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Campo, Ambassador Kane, would, would you like to comment on that as well? Maybe I could just add a point about uh, the qualities of a diplomat. I agree with the premise that they've changed uh, over the years. I guess there are two explanations for that. One is the um, increased access to information. No longer does um, a diplomat have to wait for a, a report or instructions. He can get instant information. And a second factor, I think an additional quality for diplomats these days is an ability to uh, maximize the use of the new technologies. It's no longer the telephone or the telegram, it's the immediate uh, <coughs> chat or uh, uh, the, the, the immediate email that uh, has certainly changed the way that diplomats do their business. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador, any comments? Oh, Ambassador, um, your oh, microphone is... <laughs> is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, just very quickly, I mean, it's, um, I agree both with uh, Professor Wiseman and also with uh, Noel, Ambassador Campbell, direct, uh, Sister Director Campbell, now <laughs> Professor Campbell. Um, it just, you know, people do have to realise that more and more we too are subject to things such as the 24-hour news cycle. There's not much uh, avoiding that these days. And if there is a crisis, you are expected, for example, to report in real time and also on a particular issue that's emerging, um, that information's required instantly. And so, uh, you know, the days of being able to necessarily research something in a bit more depth, I mean, it, it is trickier um, and it's all instant. So just to really endorse the previous comments and to say as someone in the field, uh, and COVID-19 is, is a good example of that, indeed, as it hits Brazil, um, of exactly that. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, I would like to, to hear the uh, position of our panelists as well, of a question we received here. Is the role of an ambassador to, inter to interfere or intervene in the politics of a sovereign nation? And the person is referring to Jim Kennedy Smith's role in the Irish peace process. Was that a personal interest or did the US government instructed her to do it? Yes, uh, thanks, Anna Paula. I think since I introduced this case, I, I, I should possibly uh, make a comment on it. Uh, yes, there was, uh, I think, yes to all of the parts of the question. Uh, uh, yes, uh, she had a personal interest uh, in the issue. Uh, Jean Kennedy Smith, as a Kennedy, had been visiting Ireland since the early 1960s. Uh, she had very close connections with the country. Um, and I suppose she had this sense of, um, uh, let's say, entitlement that, uh, let's say, certain families might have in certain situations. Um, and, but at the same time, I think the literature about this case shows that she was genuinely concerned about trying to resolve a very thorny problem that no one had been able to solve for over 20 years or so. Um, but the, the problem was the, the diplomatic one, that she was basically going out of area. And so she basically put the US ambassador, Raymond Seitz, who in London, uh, put his nose out of joint. He took great offense at this because it was basically his area to manage and not the ambassador in Ireland. And so the point that I was kind of raising here is this conundrum. When does a diplomat just push the envelope that little bit in order to help a peace process or a negotiation? Uh, so history is still a little undecided on the Jean Kennedy Smith case, uh, but I, generally speaking, ambassadors very closely respect uh, each other's territory. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, another question is, what is currently the role of the United Nations as a leader in managing global crisis and how the countries around the world must follow its advice? Mm. I, know, I, I believe uh, that Noel Campbell is going to touch on this subject. So I'll, I'll just make a general point, uh, which is one, I think the United Nations is actually one of the more interesting, 
overall successful experiments in global diplomatic leadership. Uh, the League of Nations before it failed, the United Nations has generally speaking done a pretty decent job, even though criticisms are made of it at, at, at times, and many of them are quite reasonable. The point that I would make at this point is that whereas I think diplomatic skills in a bilateral setting are different from those at the UN, and the UN is not only in New York, of course, it's all around the world in several major capitals, I think a large amount of leadership expectation rests on the shoulders of the Secretary General. Um, and of the Secretaries General uh, since uh, you know, the, the 1940s, you have people like Doug Hammarskjöld, Javier Perez de Cuellar, uh, Kofi Annan, all of whom have been successful uh, in many ways, but they have been unsuccessful Secretaries General. And this I think you can relate to their style of leadership, their ability to pull this massive system, uh, global system together. Uh, to me, it is, uh, I think, as Doug Hammarskjöld himself said, this is the most impossible job in the world, uh, pulling together the United Nations system. But my, my own personal view is that it's worth supporting. Thank you so much, Professor. So let's hear now from Ambassador Campbell. <laughs> um, um, Professor Noel Campbell is the Associate Director of the Australian National Center for Latin American Studies. And before joining the ANU, um, Mr. Noel Campbell was the Australian ambassador in Spain and also served very close to Brazil in Buenos Aires and in Lima, correct? Correct. Oh, it's so good to have you here, um, Ambassador Campbell. And you are going to share with us some practical examples of Australian diplomatic initiatives? That's right, Anna Paula. Many thanks for the introduction and uh, many thanks for those who've tuned into the session today. Uh, my background, yes, is in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. As Jeff mentioned, uh, it's um, kind of coincidental that we're both participating because we both joined the Department of Foreign Affairs in the same year. I've been on seven uh, overseas postings, and as you mentioned, uh, four of them at ambassadorial level in the former Yugoslavia, the United Arab Emirates, Spain, and most recently Argentina. So I, I also um, spent uh, four years on a leave of absence, uh, serving as Chief of Staff to the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So I think it's fair to say that in my career, both uh, in Canberra and in the field, I've been exposed to many practical examples of where Australian, Australia has shown diplomatic leadership. So whilst Jeff has focused on the conceptual parameters of leadership and diplomacy, my focus, as you mentioned, Anna, uh, Anna Paula, will be on leadership in practice. That said, let me make a, 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 an attempt to share my screen. I hope that was successful. Yes, it is. Excellent. Um, in order to give the uh, presentation a bit of structure, I wanted to look at three basic questions, in effect, those that appear on the screen, the what, the how, and the when. So let me begin. What standing does a middle power like Australia have in order to take on diplomatic leadership? For a start, we have 0.33% of the world's population. But on the other hand, by almost every relevant economic and social measure, it's actually a top 20 country. We've got the 14th largest GDP. We've got uh, the fourth largest pension fund assets, something like $2.7 trillion. Australia is the world number one exporter of coal and iron ore and aluminium and wool. Until COVID-19, we enjoyed 28 years of continuous economic growth. As many of those who are viewing this will know, we're the fourth, and most, the fourth most attractive destination for international students. In terms of lifestyle, we are perceived at least as a global leader with three of the 10 most livable cities being located in Australia. But in addition to these sorts of empirical measures, I think it's fair to say that uh, Australia has two basic pillars that also underline its uh, peace and prosperity as a nation. First, 
We're an open liberal democracy committed to freedom and the rule of law. Second, we're an open export oriented market economy. So taken together, these factors undoubtedly influence the perception about Australia's standing, just as they influence its ability to engage with other nations, to build relationships, and ultimately to exercise diplomatic leadership. So I wouldn't wish to overstate it, but nor should Australia's uh, status be understated. So let's make the assumption that Australia has certain standing to exercise diplomatic leadership. How does it achieve that in practice? Now, there's no single answer to this. It could be argued that it's all about diplomatic engagement. How many diplomatic missions a country has? How many diplomats? The quality of its diplomats? What budgetary resources are dedicated to the foreign affairs portfolio? Others view it as a way of leverage of its standing in terms of using its power. These are sometimes categorized as um, hard power or soft power or smart power. So let's just see for a moment how this terminology applies in the case of Australia. Hard power covers a wide range of coercive policies from military action and military alliances to economic sanctions or inducements. And let me be quite clear, Australia is not a superpower. We don't have a history of using unilaterally military power to achieve diplomatic objectives. We've almost always relied in practice on treaty alliances with other countries or US Security Council mandates before engaging in military operations. Our participation in the Gulf War, the deployment of Australian troops in East Timor, and the commitment of military personnel to Afghanistan after September 11 are cases in point. Australia has, however, used economic power to help realize diplomatic goals. We've done this in a couple of ways. One is persuasive through the negotiation of a network of mutually beneficial free trade agreements. I think it was about 14 at last count, with another six under negotiation. The other economic lever, if you like, is more punitive through the imposition of economic sanctions, whether imposed by the UN Security Council or, autonom or autonomous sanctions that Australia has uh, imposed as a uh, matter of Australian foreign policy. Soft power, on the other hand, is a more persuasive power. The Harvard academic Joseph Nye observed that soft power is about getting others to buy into our values. So what soft power assets can Australia draw on? And what mediums can it use to enhance its ability to demonstrate diplomatic leadership and influence? Some of Australia's soft power's assets are tangible. Our aid program, for example, our readiness to assist in natural and human disasters, especially in our immediate neighborhood in the South Pacific. Others are less tangible. The image of Australia as being a place of natural beauty, its exotic flora and fauna, its multicultural society, its livable cities. Now, these are all very positive, but are they sufficient to counter criticism from time to time that Australia's approach to asylum and immigration, uh, to indigenous affairs and to foreign aid have dented its standing and hence its capacity to use soft power in international relations? I guess the real answer to this question lies in how effective Australia has been on drawing on and using those assets to ensure that Australia is a persuasive force in the region and internationally. So let's look at a couple of examples of how soft power has been exerted. The education of international students is, the, is an obvious example. It's not only a significant source of export earnings, it's a medium for international engagement and it reinforces the perception of Australia as a diverse and democratic and welcoming society. Research collaboration between universities and scientific institutions is another. Sports diplomacy, uh, supporting visit programs for foreign media, expanding our outreach by making more creative use of uh, digital media, cultural diplomacy, that is to say the sharing of cultural knowledge through food or art or dance or literature, Actually, in 2019, Australia was ranked the ninth 
most, uh, sorry, was ranked ninth globally in the, in the soft power index. So I guess that means we're doing something right. Now, I know that the notion of soft power doesn't appeal to everybody, and that's okay. It'll never reflect the sum total of Australian power, and it's not meant to. I have to say, I'm a bit more attracted by the notion of smart power. And this was described by former US Assistant Secretary of State Chester Crocker is the strategic use of diplomacy, persuasion, capacity building, and the projection of power and influence in ways that are cost effective and have political and social legitimacy. So let me now turn to the third question I raised at the outset. When has Australia played a leadership role and what have been the results? I hope that you'll forgive me for being a little self-indulgent, but the examples I've chosen are ones in which I've had a small hand in either directly or indirectly. Firstly, let's consider at the bilateral level. Australia was a key player in, in trying to meet the challenge of persuading the United States to agree to impose a ban on mining in Antarctica. By way of background, uh, in 1988, after seven long years of negotiations, the parties to the Antarctic Treaty reached a consensus on a convention to regulate the Antarctic mineral resource activities. It was called CRAMRA. Australia and France shocked other members of the Antarctic Treaty system by announcing in 1989 that they would not sign up to CRAMRA, but instead they'd push for a ban on mining in the continent. Now, not unexpectedly, the United States and Japan and initially the United Kingdom were very upset they said that Australia and France had torpedoed years of careful international negotiation. This process actually occurred uh, at a time when I was posted as counsellor to the Australian Embassy in Washington and was part of my bilateral remit in the embassy to seek to persuade the US administration to support the negotiation of an instrument to protect the Antarctic environment, including a ban on mining. So what did we do? Well, we garnered support from other Antarctic Treaty players for a new instrument focusing on protection of the environment. We encouraged others to work on the text of a draft instrument, initially that involved Chile and the United Kingdom, so that we had an alternative text to offer. We engaged closely with UN line departments and agencies responsible for Antarctic affairs. We lobbied the US Congress particularly members who were sympathetic to the idea of protecting the Antarctic environment, not least at that time, uh, the then Senator Al Gore. We made submissions to congressional committees. We submitted op-ed pieces to major newspapers. We engaged with NGOs who'd taken a lead on the issue. And we used the uh, ministerial and other senior visits to the United States to promote the issue. The result was that in July of 1991, President Bush Sr. announced that the United States would drop its opposition to the Australian French proposal and sign on to the new instrument, the Madrid Protocol. We had to make compromises, no question about it. The Madrid Protocol, as it suggests, is not a standalone treaty, it's a protocol to the Antarctic Treaty. And instead of a permanent ban, the protocol contains a provision whereby a party can propose to lift the mining ban after 50 years, that's in 2048, but only, I stress only, if three quarters of the consultative parties to the Antarctic Treaty agree. So what are the lessons learned from this bilateral experience of, of, of showing leadership? I think uh, it's very clear one of the lessons was the value of building on an existing positive bilateral relationship that we had with the United States but also the importance of forging new relationships with decision makers, the importance of adding weight to bilateral representations by working in tandem with other like-minded missions, making joint representations, for example. Also the importance of using a, a diverse range of influences beyond the administration itself to press the case. I mentioned Congress, congressional committees, the media, NGOs, I guess, the importance of keeping the issue constantly in the public eye, but also at the end of the day, being willing to compromise, keeping in mind Voltaire's mantra of not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
A second uh, leadership example I'd like to uh, draw on is one that was indeed at the multilateral level, and this was the Cambodia peace process in, in 1989-90, where Australia took the initiative to try and uh, uh, reach a solution to this protracted issue. If you may recall, by the late 1980s, Cambodia was really on its knees. Since 1970, it had been ravaged by massive US bombing, by a civil war, by a genocidal reign of terror under Pot Pole and the Khmer Rouge, an invasion by Vietnam, which had brought an end to the reign of terror, but it had triggered another civil war, resulting overall in the death of some 2 million Cambodians. Now, a number of international efforts had been made previously to negotiate a return to normality among the essentially four warring factions, but all of them had failed. So it was to break that impasse that Australia developed a peace proposal in November 1989. And its idea, the core idea, was to sidestep the issue of power sharing amongst the four warring factions, which had bedeviled all the efforts until then. Rather, it was uh, a proposal that the United Nations should be involved in a very direct and extensive way, not just in peacekeeping or electoral monitoring, as is more usual, but in the actual governance of the country during a transition period. period. This, of course, was a way to give China a face-saving method of withdrawing its support from the Khmer Rouge, which it was assumed would then wither and die on the vine. Let me just say a word on the process. The initial response was very positive. Within weeks, most of the key players of the region and importantly, the members of the, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council had given public or private endorsement to the proposal. Australia fleshed out the proposal with a very detailed plan. We called it the Red Book for the administrative structure, the budget and other data for the transitional UN administration. And we continued to work behind the scenes as responsibility for the initiative was then taken up by the Indonesian foreign minister and the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. The result was that the UN Security Council established a UN transitional authority in Cambodia, UNTAC, in February 1992. The authority was set up in Cambodia in place a month later and elections were held in May 1993. I guess my question then is well, what lessons did we learn from that? I think uh, it's worth looking at the um, reflections of the then Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans, who took the, char took the lead on this uh, um, issue and himself drew a number of lessons from the process. He said it requires commitment of serious resources, both in quantity and quality. It requires the creativity and stamina on the part of the proponents and a willingness to work with all the players that matter, no matter how ugly their past behavior may have been. In terms of any agreement or process, it must be resilient, resilient enough to deal with the spoilers, the party that would lead, seek to undermine implementation or enforcement. It's got to get the right balance between peace and justice and it's got to have the necessary degree of international support with all the guarantees and commitment of resources that are necessary to make the solution stick. The third example I want to draw on is of leadership at the institutional level, the leadership that I think Australia attempted to exert as a non-member of the, a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council in 2013-2014, and that's leading the Security Council's response to the downing of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17. Again, by way of background, you may recall that in, on 17 July 2014, Malaysian Airlines flight MH17, traveling from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, was brought down in eastern Ukraine near the Russian border. That was uh, the scene of heavy fighting, of course, between the Ukrainian forces and Russian separatists. All 298 people aboard the plane were killed, including 38 Australians. The US and the UK were rather reluctant to pay a lead role on the issue, so Australia led the charge. We drafted and led negotiations on a resolution condemning the downing of the, the flight, 
which was adopted unanimously on 21 July 2014 as Resolution 2166, just four days after the crash. Now, the resolution had four main elements. It called on separatists at the crash, at the crash site to ensure the bodies of the victims were treated with dignity and respect. It underlined the need for a full, thorough and independent investigation into the crash. It demanded that military activities in the area cease to enable access to the site. And it demanded that those responsible for the incident be held to account. As it happened, Russia did back the resolution, but only at the 11th hour and after some changes were made to the text, including the characterization of the incident as the downing of MH17, rather than the shooting down, the sorts of compromises diplomats have to make. But looking back, given the reticence of some key Security Council members to pursue urgent action on flight MH17, resolution 2166 probably would not have been adopted without Australia's strong motivation and determination. How did we do that? First and foremost, we acted quickly and firmly. We gained diplomatic support for the resolution, not only from inside the Council, but also from UN members beyond it. And Australian's foreign, Australia's foreign minister travelled personally to New York during the negotiations, which added political weight and momentum to the push for prompt Council action. So that's essentially what I wanted to say. Uh, Jeff raised the question, Right at the outset, is it realistic to talk about leadership in the context of international diplomacy? In my view, and without exaggerating Australia's own record, I think it can be, given the right conditions, as he mentioned. So just as a final word looking ahead, the reality is that the catalogue of issues that are intrinsically transnational is significant and it's growing. From global pandemics to arms control, from cybersecurity to freedom of navigation, from addressing climate change to protecting human rights. They need to be addressed by strengthening existing, existing rules or in some cases by creating new ones. And this requires leadership in all the forms elaborated by Jeff, not least by new and emerging powers like Brazil or middle powers like Australia. So I'll leave it there, Ana Paula, um, and look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Professor, and thanks for sharing all those examples with us. We do have some questions here, and one of them is about uh, exactly about talking with this big diversity of actors and, and stakeholders involved in diplomatic issues. Um, how important is that discussion to imagine minorities in, diplom in diplomacy leadership positions? And do you think such a thing as decolonial diplomacy is possible, or is it a controversy in itself? Sorry, colonial diplomacy, did you say? Decolonial diplomacy. So, uh, sorry, I'm not sure. Um, okay. As to the first uh, part of the question, whether uh, minorities should be part of the panorama of actors who are consulted, I think it depends very much on the issue. Clearly, some uh, issues are of uh, more importance to certain minority groups than to others. If we talk about the environment, climate change, biodiversity, desertification, clearly in negotiating any international instrument, the NGOs in the environmental sector are going to be major players. Equally, I don't know whether you can call them minorities, but industry groups uh, who also have an economic interest in environmental issues are going to be major players. If we're talking about certain human rights issues, then clearly LGBT, LGBT groups and indigenous groups are going to be key players. They're going to be players who can make an input into practical outcomes because their buy-in is going to be critical to the success and the implementation of whatever standards are agreed. So as to that um, question, I think the answer is yes, but it depends very much on the issue uh, concerned. Uh, I still didn't quite get the term that you mentioned in, in, the, in the second uh, part of the question. Uh, the, the term that our guest used was decolonial diplomacy. Decolonial diplomacy. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he means, but maybe it's the context of uh, uh, the world um, in 2020 rather than the world in uh, uh, 1960. Clearly, there are, are uh, huge uh, 
there's been a huge expansion in the number of players who are available and that's created uh, its own dynamics no longer is it the sort of big big stick diplomacy that uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, used in the early 1900s rather a more consulted diplomacy post World War II and with so many different actors with so many different priorities uh, clearly uh, the consensus making element of uh, leadership and diplomacy has been more um, more difficult and more demanding. But I think over the years, new alliances have emerged. We shouldn't imagine that all countries who are former colonies uh, uh, work as a monolithic bloc. That's absolutely not so. Just as in the case of minority groups, I think it depends very much on the issue and every country or group of countries takes positions that are consonant with their uh, with their um, national or regional interests, as the case may be. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we do have two questions here asking about other Australian initiatives. Uh, one of our guests is asking about, uh, were there any other initiatives besides the, uh, the, uh, the Malaysian Airlines case during the Australia's term in the UN Security Council, 2013-2014, if there were other initiatives that you would like to mention? And uh, another uh, guest asking about uh, what was the outcome of the initiative of Australia calling very early for an independent international inquiry on the outbreak of COVID? Oh, thanks for the easy questions, Anna Paula. <laughs> um, as to the first one, that is to say, what other initiatives uh, did we take during our term on the UN Security Council? I think it's important to rem remind ourselves that uh, that period, 2013-2014, coincided with a period of tremendous um, deterioration, if you like, in terms of global security and humanitarian crises. We just need to think of Syria, Afghanistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Yemen. There were more peacekeeping missions than at, in at any other time. And the, the number of sanctions regimes in place was also at an all-time all high. But let me just mention a couple of specific examples. On Syria, for example, when we joined the uh, Security Council, the Council was deadlocked on Syria with repeated examples of the use of the veto by uh, one or more of the, the, the permanent five members. We took the view that the Council needed to act. Too many civilians were getting killed and injured. So, we led negotiations on a resolution to enable UN agencies to deliver humanitarian aid across borders without the, the consent of the, the Syrian authorities. It's the first uh, ever of, of that kind of resolution. So that was one initiative that we finally broke the deadlock of no UN security action on Syria in this very um, targeted area of uh, delivery of humanitarian aid. Another um, development in relation to Syria was uh, the question of chemical weapons. You may recall that uh, during that period, it was revealed that Syria had used uh, chemical weapons in the suburbs of Damascus. And there was a real possibility of the use of force against the regime, but Australia helped avert that crisis by pushing for an agreement on a joint plan, ultimately developed between the US and Russia to eliminate security as chemical weapons under UN supervision. Uh, let me just raise one other, one other um, issue, which is sanctions. Uh, during our period on the Council, we were um, chair of several of the Council's sanctions committees. Uh, because of the proliferation of committees and the proliferation of procedures, uh, we decided to sponsor the first high-level review on the sanctions regimes, the first one that had occurred for about 20 years, and that was a an initiative that was more procedural, I guess, but it sharpened the focus and the procedures of committees and had more continuity, if you like, in the approaches of the committees so that they could be compared and measured. So maybe I stop there, otherwise I'm going to continue for the rest of the session. Oh, sorry, I better say something about the, um, the, the related question of... of uh, the initiative of um, initiating an independent international inquiry on COVID. Okay, okay. As I said, you're, thanks for the hard questions. Um, listen, my recollection is that it must have been mid-April the Australian Foreign Minister proposed an independent inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. 
Now, the purpose of this was really to seek out the facts with a view to learning lessons on prevention and responding to future pandemics. But as you know, the proposal was roundly criticized by China, who saw it as somehow being targeted at China's handling of the pandemic. Um, again, I'm just sticking to the facts here. Uh, Australia's announcement was followed, perhaps coincidentally, with a number of measures taken by the Chinese against Australia. The, the Chinese ambassador in Canberra warned that China might be deterred from buying Australian goods in future. An education ministry spokesman warned that Chinese students should consider carefully whether to study in Australia because of allegations of uh, race, uh, racism against Asians. A few days later, Chinese tourists were warned to reconsider travel post-COVID to Australia for the same reason. Another coincidence was an 80% tariff was placed on the import of barley from Australia. And China suspended imports from four major meat firms. So here we have a situation where we were, um, that there was a, a, a very shrill response to an initiative that we had taken. Not deterred, however, we consulted closely with other, um, uh, other countries interested in the, in, the, in the proposition, which was eventually taken up by the, by the EU, and they drafted a resolution calling for an independent inquiry at the World Health Assembly one month later. Uh, Australia co-sponsored that re resolution. It toughened some of the language. For example, there was uh, uh, no direct reference to China. We had to make compromises. And instead of an investigation, the uh, resolution referred to uh, a review and, and insisted that it be coordinated by the WHO. But the bottom line is that the idea survived. It was adopted on the 18th of May by the largest number of co-sponsors in WHO history. Now, the Chinese uh, wanted to have the last word and said it was actually a slap in the face for Australia because it wasn't, it wasn't the... Uh, independent review that uh, we had originally sought, but uh, let me repeat the substance of the uh, resolution and the substance of Australian, Australia's argument at the time remains intact. The WHO agreed uh, at the earliest moment, appropriate moment, and I'm quoting here, for a stepwise process of impartial, independent and comprehensive evaluation. So uh, you may question the mechanics of what we did. Maybe we should have consulted uh, more broadly earlier, but the outcome by uh, passing the baton, if you like, to the EU in the, this case and working through the um, World Health Assembly resulted in the um, outcome that uh, we, we had sought at the outset. And those are all aspects that have to be considered while dealing with uh, diplomatic affairs like that. Like, for example, uh, we have uh, some comments here about these discussions uh, with China and as well having to deal with the dissatisfaction of part of the population with the Australian alignment with the US. All those are elements that diplomats have to deal with, correct? Yeah, you're quite right. I mean, we always have to look um, not only at international ramifications, not only at international uh, um, partners, not only at uh, ways that we can uh, garner support to uh, further uh, Australia's foreign policy interests, we have to be conscious also of the domestic element. And just harping back to some of the themes I mentioned at the beginning uh, of environment and human rights and uh, um, trade agreements, uh, reform of the uh, WTO, these all in, uh, involve domestic actors who have a voice, who have a view, who have influence uh, within the body politic domestically and which have to be consulted. If I can just say in relation to human rights, in an earlier incarnation, I was the, the branch head of the branch that deals with international organizations. Each year, we religiously have what's called the human rights dialogue with NGOs and community groups so that we can explain what Australia's priorities are, so that we can hear the response domestically uh, to what those priorities are and what we are doing, how we propose to do it. And in that way, uh, getting buy-in for what uh, for policy initiatives that Australia wishes to take the lead on or pursue in the international arena.
Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we do have some more questions here, but we are going to address them after our next speaker, which I have the honor to introduce. It's the Australian ambassador to Brazil, His Excellency Tim Kane. Ambassador Kane has also served in Chile and Mexico, so also very familiar with Latin America. And if I'm not wrong, is a former graduate of the Australian National University. Is that it, Ambassador? Yes, that's right. That's right. I, we uh, had to do a course when I first joined Foreign Affairs. And so I've got um, a graduate diploma from the ANU as part of that. And half, half a law degree from the ANU. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And a, well, very nice of you to invite me to participate in this uh, webinar. And it's very nice to be here with Professor Wiseman and also with Professor Campbell. I had the privilege of overlapping when Noel was ambassador in Argentina and I was in Chile. And we've known each other before that as well. It's good to see Nick Johnson uh, as well. He was in Brasilia when I was in Chile. So it all ties in pretty well. Um, it's, it's very, we very much welcome as the Australian Embassy in Brazil uh, this initiative and innovative ways of engaging our Brazilian alumni of Australian educational institutions. We're launching these webinars, by the way, for the first time, and it's a privilege to do so with the Australian National University and the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies. These webinars are being held in place of our Australia Brazil Leadership Conference, uh, which normally takes place in Brazil each year. And this year, of course, we're unable to do that because of the coronavirus. There's been a strong turnout for the webinars and there have been some terrific discussions. And tonight is no exception, or this morning is no exception. Uh, and indeed, I'm enjoying learning from Professors Wiseman and Campbell as much as everybody else. Uh, and we've got two more to go. So we're very pleased indeed with that initiative. Uh, I'd like to thank the ANU and ANCLUS for their assistance, especially Professor Wiseman and Professor Campbell, and to you too, Anna Paula, um, and also to our alumni for their ongoing support of Australian education, of each other, and for the valuable contribution they make to Australia-Brazil relations. Uh, my comments tonight are very much squarely in the bilateral relationship uh, area. Uh, just to give people an update of what we have been focusing on, certainly before COVID-19 uh, and as we're dealing with the disease and also what our agenda is starting to look like uh, post COVID-19. It's very important in that context to just remind the audience in case they needed it, uh, that COVID-19 has definitely not peaked in Brazil and very few analysts would say with any certainty when the virus is likely to do so. It's a very, very challenging time and it's difficult to make any sort of forecast given that the disease continues to take a high toll on the Brazilian people, the Brazilian healthcare system, and of course the Brazilian economy. There are now more than 1.35 million recorded infections here and over 58 thousand officially recorded deaths from the virus. There's no doubt that Brazil, like so many other countries, will be hit hard. Leading economists are already suggesting Brazilian economy will contract by 8% this year. Uh, foreign investors have already withdrawn 12 billion US dollars from the Brazilian stock market and some 19 billion dollars US from the Brazilian bond market. Unemployment is at 12% and rising, but it's important for us to start giving some attention, as I say, to the situation of Brazil as it will look like coming out of the virus. And we very much need to be optimistic and forward leaning. On education, and it's important to the bilateral relationship between Australia and Brazil, let me say that Brazil is currently the largest source of international students in Australia outside of Asia and our fourth largest market globally. There are more than 110 active agreements between Australian education institutions and Brazilian governments and institutions. During the pandemic, 12,000 Brazilian students 
have enrolled in free online courses provided by social learning platform FutureLearn and its partnership with Austray. Brazilians make an enormous contribution to Australian education. We value their involvement in this important sector and we welcome the ongoing innovation they bring to Australia. All of you know Brazil is a massive internal market of more than 210 million people, 150 million of whom are characterised as a consuming class. Brazil is the world's eighth largest consumer market. It's estimated at 1.2 trillion US dollars. This serves as a huge engine for creating and sustaining growth. Brazil is the, the world's sixth largest country by population, fifth largest in geographical area and the ninth largest economy. It is a global player including in agriculture, mining and manufacturing. Just to take agriculture as an example, Brazil is essentially self-sufficient and is the world's largest supplier of coffee, oranges and cassava, and a leading supplier of sugar, soy and beef. Brazil is a significant economic partner for Australia. More than half of all Australian exports to Latin America go to Brazil. And when it comes to investment, we often think of Australia's important mining investments in Pacific Latin America. However, there is more Australian investment in Brazil across a wider range of sectors than the rest of Latin America combined. Brazil's opportunities are comparable to those of many of Australia's Indo-Pacific neighbours. But we need to be very focused in Brazil. To filter Australian priorities, to ensure we're pursuing what's especially relevant for Australia and Brazil. Obvious important areas are education. We work closely on ensuring an open international trading environment. We are doing a lot of work to share Australian experience to make a tangible difference in Brazil, such as on economic reforms, environmental management, and our integration with the Indo-Pacific. To drill down a little further, the Australian Embassy in Brasilia and the Australian Consulate General in Sao Paulo have been prioritising the following areas. A work and holiday maker, Memorandum of Understanding. This is an important initiative and it was all but finalised when the coronavirus struck. It will open our societies to opportunities for young people to work and holiday in each other's countries and has important implications for tourism education and the services sector generally. Australia's support for Brazil's membership of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is an important step for Brazil and the OECD. We were enhancing our collaboration in the Cairns Group of agricultural, agricultural exporting uh, countries. We were cooperating and continue to cooperate very closely in the G20. This year marks the 75th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Australia and Brazil. It's an important milestone and reflects the depth and length of our relationship. We certainly had heard calls from business and were promoting the merits of a double taxation agreement. We work closely with the Brazilian government in the role of agencies such as the Australian Productivity Commission, our superannuation and higher education finance systems and developments in key sectors such as tourism and mining. We were very much involved in the investigation of closer flights between Brazil and Australia. The technology is now available to ensure non-stop flights between Australia and Brazil. While inevitably it will be a commercial decision, there is no doubt that it is growing in importance. It's important to note as well that Brazilians comprise the largest Latin American community in Australia. With around 50,000 people, that represents an increase of more than 800% since the year 2001. I should also add that all of the issues I mentioned, we were, we were working on, we continue to do so, and most of those will form part of our agenda as we emerge from COVID-19. I'm very conscious of the time and for participants to have an opportunity to ask more questions and to comment. So I'll conclude my remarks by highlighting that Australia's bilateral relationship with Brazil has some good opportunities in areas such as agribusiness, 
infrastructure, healthcare and mining. We have some great case studies of Brazilian companies that have been enormously successful in Australia and brought new ideas and jobs. JBS, Natura and Marco Polo are just some of them and their plans for further growth, particularly into the Indo-Pacific from Australia, are very impressive indeed. Of course, a bilateral relationship goes far beyond commercial opportunities, education engagement and treaties. It's also about people to people links, cooperating together on the global stage to ensure a fairer and better world, working together to protect and preserve the environment and much, much more. We've heard this morning about leadership and diplomacy and how Australia has led and exerted significant influence regionally and globally. In the bilateral context, Australia has demonstrated to Brazilians its capacity inter alia as a leader of quality and flexible education, as a reliable commercial and investment partner, and on deep engagement with the Indo-Pacific, economic reform, success as a multicultural society, a world-class mining nation, a respected middle power internationally and more. Our message is an important one, and just as importantly, we can learn from Brazil in its leadership in some areas such as agribusiness. This morning's webinar reminds us that international leadership is especially useful when it enhances the quality of life of people around the world. I'll leave it there. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And while you were speaking, you were already uh, addressing some of the questions that were coming. Uh, we had questions about what, uh, what is the future of some trade relations between uh, the countries, for example, and you gave us a very good overview of that. Um, would you be able to talk briefly about what do you expect to be the current trend about immigration to Australia? Uh, for Brazilians interested in immigration? Yeah, look, it's a very good question. I think we're going to have to wait and see um, what happens following the virus in both countries. We're certainly very keen to pick up again and conclude as quickly as we can the Work and Holiday Maker program because we know that there's very high demand here amongst uh, Brazilians. And certainly we see increasing interest on the part of Australians to come this way. So that will definitely be a priority for us. As I said in my remarks, we were very close to achieving that before COVID-19. And we're optimistic that we will be able to conclude it in the next few months. So let me say that that would be a good start. Um, we, we know that so much of the traffic from South America to Australia, to Australia is Brazilian. And uh, you know, we also know that, as I say, the community, the Brazilian community in Australia has grown enormously. Uh, that is set to continue. And what uh, Brazilians are doing in Australia in areas such as medical research, uh, in agribusiness, in other areas, quite frankly, makes them terrific immigrants. So we would hope most uh, happily that that continues. And uh, indeed, one of the things that we were working on was the government's Global Talent Program, which was a special program around the world to promote uh, immigration of, of talented individuals. And indeed, um, there were a number of candidates here. So these sorts of things we look forward to pursuing as we come out of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. will, be, will there be any discussions in, in how to maybe support that given the uh, difference currency uh, and exchange rate? Uh, it's a bit unfavorable, uh, not favorable for Brazilians at the moment. Um, how do you yes. see the monetary aspect affecting those relations? Yes, look, I, it's a good question. I, I, I'm not sure I could hazard an answer. Um, I think that the currencies sort of go up and down. Um, I think we all of us just have to, to weather that storm. Um, but um, in terms of it sort of impacting overall on the relationship, um, we, we would like to think that it wouldn't have a significant negative impact. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And uh, another question that we have here in uh, Professor Scampo's presentation, he mentioned the Australia's aid program as part of the soft power of Australia. Uh, it has declined slightly in the past few years and now with the COVID situation, um, it was a bit reduced. Does it affect Australia's position as a diplomatic leader or is that one of those choices that you have to do when you have other things to solve? Um, wh what do you think, Ambassador, and also uh, Professor Campbell, because you introduced the theme? Okay, let me begin. Uh, it's true, uh, the trend has been a reduction in real terms about Australia's uh, aid program. I think we're now in the lower third of OECD countries. That said, it's still not insubstantial. I think in 2019, as I recall, it was about two point, sorry, $4.3 billion, which was more than the two previous years, but obviously not uh, as much as it was in its peak. Uh, I think another point to be made is that uh, the priority is still very much on our immediate region, on the South Pacific. And uh, in terms of, in real terms, I think uh, the aid program has, is largely intact in, in that region. I think another point to bear in mind is that aid is just one of a menu of um, elements to, uh, to, to Australia's soft power. Uh, it's an important one, yes, but it's not the only one. I think I rattled off a number of other ones, uh, ranging from cultural diplomacy to sports diplomacy um, to, uh, to tourism. There are many other ways of connecting, of um, uh, promoting Australia, of promoting opportunities, of exerting influence. Uh, I think uh, as a final point, uh, in many cases, recipient countries would like nothing better than not being recipient countries. What they need in many cases is an economic uplift and that can often be um, achieved not only by grants of money but by negotiating, for example, free trade agreements. And with many of the countries of the South Pacific, we are engaged in that process right now so that via a mechanism of a free, free trade agreement, uh, their trade and exports can be enhanced, their income can be increased, and their growth can be uh, can benefit as a result. So I think uh, we need to look at aid in a broader context uh, of other soft power levers, and we need to look at the reality that um, there's more than uh, just giving development assistance as a way of uh, inducing economic growth and prosperity. Thank you so much, Professor Campbell. Uh, would you like to uh, add anything, Ambassador? No, look, I think that's a very good summary. I mean, in Brazil, we have a small direct aid program. And from that, we have been able to uh, finance projects which have had a significant impact, such as uh, part of the recovery from the Brumaginho tailings dam disaster. And we've also been able to reach out into some of the favelas and some of the larger cities and help with programs that enable underprivileged children to use sport by way of um, moving into education and therefore having a much better chance of breaking often what, what is a, a poverty cycle. So um, it is important here, it's, it's not a huge program, but from it we have been able to have um, a, a fairly, significant impact in terms of improving the lives of those um, for whom we, we, we sort of focus those, those projects. Thank you so much. And before we address the last questions, I would like to invite one of our attendees to join us uh, today. If I could have um, Fernanda Benini, a former master's student at the Australia Pacific College of Diplomacy. She'll be joining us in a minute to share her experience here in Australia. Good evening, Fernanda. It's very nice Hi. to be here. Hi. Hello. Uh, can you hear me and see me? Yes, I can. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful session. It's been a 
really wonderful discussion, really interesting to hear from such experienced professionals about this topic, which obviously interests me being Brazilian and being a student of diplomacy. Also really good to see Professor Weizmann, even if through a screen and from very far away. <laughs> I am currently in Brazil. Um, and I guess I'm speaking directly to the alumni, right, about my experience. Okay, so I'm gonna go right through it because I know it's a, I have a short time. So if you could share with us two or three minutes of your experience. Sure, yeah, okay. So I guess there's only one point I like to make about um, my experience, hopefully one that relates it to, I guess, the main topic of our discussion here. Um, I guess when I was choosing my degree, I had the opportunity of going to an American university. And with hindsight, I'm glad I didn't for various reasons. And um, I guess most importantly, uh, looking back at my, my experience and the things that I learned um, in this degree and in Australia at the ANU. Um, I'm glad, I'm really grateful for my learning journey. Um, this degree in particular has a very distinct Australian DNA, I guess. Uh, of course, we were dealing with a lot of issues that were not necessarily related to Australia, but we were definitely looking at the world from an Australian viewpoint, which is very interesting, uh, especially coming from um, Brazil and not having, in my particular case, with my background, a lot of knowledge about the Pacific or about um, the Asia Pacific region prior to this degree. So it was quite interesting to um, learn uh, diplomacy um, from this uh, perspective, I guess. Um, but also, I guess, um, something that's also quite um, interesting and I like to mention is that, of course, Brazil and Australia are very different, but um, there's some uh, similarities that I that didn't go unnoticed for me at least. Um, I think they're quite relevant. So, for example, um, in some of my courses, we talked about um, Australia's campaigns um, to have a seat at the UN Security Council, and I guess this is a this is a thing that um, <laughs> for me was really interesting, being Brazilian and knowing that also my country has um, um, a lot of interests in. Uh, and has already been to the UN Security Council, but has interests in uh, uh, having a seat again and having another opportunity um, at this uh, council. So it's quite interesting to, to see that um, there's some challenges that both Australia and Brazil face and to learn um, about diplomacy and international politics, international relations from this perspective, as opposed to, as I was sharing um, in the beginning um, from my experience um, from an American university perspective, which probably wouldn't, um, I guess, um, spend a lot of time um, talking about the efforts involved and the uh, challenges involved in trying to have a, a bigger voice in global diplomacy. Um, I guess that's um, what I have to share. Uh, I'm glad to, uh, I'm really excited to hear what the others have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernanda. And it's lovely to hear from your experience and what you learn. Um, I am myself a former student of international affairs at the ANU as well. So I can definitely relate to a lot of things that you just mentioned and all this perspective that we get while we are studying. Uh, we have some more questions from our audience here. Uh, if our panelists have any comments, if they would like to comment on what Fernanda brought to us. We have questions that also um, are talking about trade and immigration here. We have a very quick question, Ambassador Kane. Someone probably really liked what you said and is wanting to work for you. Do you hire Brazilians in the Australian embassy or just Australians? <laughs> um, I believe the answer for that one is that yes, Brazilians can work at the Australian embassy. It depends yeah. on the requirement of the job, correct? Yeah, no, we certainly have a mixture here of Australian and Brazilian staff. And uh, we do hire people from time to time. And it's worth keeping an eye on our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter, and uh, also the Embassy webpage. Um, the Embassy is not huge here, but certainly from time to time, we do advertise positions. Mm -hmm. And a question here about the relationship of Australia with Asian markets. Uh, and I think that thinking of what you said before, we can guess the answer. Do you think the government or Australian companies should look into other regions, especially Latin America? 
Well, it's that I think any 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 one of the three of us could answer that one very easily. But certainly from my perspective, it's a no-brainer, and definitely. And I often say publicly, it's not um, Asia or it's Asia and, and no more so than in the context of Latin America. And in terms of diversification of markets, for example, um, it's it's a very very good option. And again and again and again, as I know Noel can testify to, the opportunities here are tremendous. So um, I could talk for hours on that, but maybe I'll let uh, Noel and, and Professor Weissman ha have a go because, um, uh, yes, I, I might just start to bore people if I keep going. Well, because we are just a bit conscious of time, I'll just go through one more question and then I'll finalise this one question for all of you. Um, so one of the questions that I have now for the ambassador is uh, how do you think that the new strategy for the Australian government for permanent migration can affect um, the relationships and I would guess especially with Brazil we are thinking about bringing uh, students to keep the relationships but a reduction in quotas for migration could affect that relationship? Uh, look, it's, yeah, I, I don't. I don't necessarily think so. I mean, um, immigration is, is an issue that's sort of separate in a way to overall bilateral relations. And I think the bilateral relations uh, ship with Brazil is a very strong one. It's growing. We have a lot in common, and I see that continuing. Uh, and it's very much a two-way street. It's not just what we can share and 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 sort of. Um, in part to Brazil, it's also what we can learn from Brazil. So, um, and indeed, um, the statistics demonstrate that over the last decade and more, that's an upwards trajectory and I see that continuing. So, from my perspective, uh, the short answer is uh, no. Thank you. And I would like to finalise with a question for our three panellists. It came initially for Professor Campbell, but I think you can all contribute to that. What would you have done differently in your diplomatic career? And what advice would you give to young leaders that want to pursue this career path? Uh, if we could start maybe with Professor Wiseman. Um, thanks so much. Uh, that, that is a, a tricky one. Um, I think the specific career advice I would give to young diplomats is to choose the most difficult possible posting abroad imaginable and go to your human resources department and say you want that post um, and the the reason for this is i think i i think fairly obvious you do not want to go to um, the so-called comfortable let's call them european postings first off uh, you don't want to go to big postings because you you will be swallowed um, by the hierarchy and the protocol of diplomacy, which has its place, of course, but nonetheless, for junior diplomats, I would say go for um, what we call in Australia, at least, what we did in my day, a hardship posting first and even second, and then go for more comfortable postings, Ambassador Kane, such as Brasilia. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Campbell, what would you say? Okay, I have to say on reflection, there's very little that I would do differently. I think um, over the course of the 35 years I, I, I was with the diplomatic um, service, I would have benefited from having a bit more understanding or uh, knowledge of, of, of new technologies. But again, one picks, uh, picks a lot of that up on the job. One thing I would recommend uh, uh, that Jeff mentioned was uh, not to be fixated about going to London, Paris or Rome my first posting and my last posting was Buenos Aires and that changed my life. I acquired a new language uh, because of that new language I met and married my wife who's Chilean uh, and uh, it, it, it was the start of a long uh, uh, a, a long-term relationship if you like with Latin America. Another piece of advice so drawing on my own experience is if there's an opportunity to leave the service for a while take it I had the good fortune to be uh, um, approached to be the Chief of Staff to the Director General of the IAEA in Vienna and that was a wonderful experience which really enriched my career and I think benefited uh, uh, the job because I was able to see how a Secretariat works from the position of the Secretariat instead of being a delegate at, at, a, at an organisational meeting. 
one um, final uh, remark maybe is um, to uh, to try and diversify your postings. I think many young diplomats come in saying, right, I'm going to be a European expert. I'm going to be a, a, a multilateral expert. In the course of my career, I've had both bilateral and multilateral postings. I've had uh, postings on four different continents. And although that was not what I perceived or imagined when I joined, when I did think that uh, London, Paris or Rome would be just great, uh, I have no regrets whatsoever. And I think that should uh, always be your um, mindset when you join the Foreign Service to, uh, to explore, to look for the unusual rather than the usual. Uh, often, uh, again, just to reinforce uh, Jeff's point, uh, a small post can enable you to have much more interesting things to do. It can expose you to much more senior people and can be much more rewarding and uh, professionally for you. Thank you so much, Professor Kempo. And Ambassador, what, what would be your advice to young diplomats? Um, yeah, well, look, I, look, I agree with Professor Wiseman and with um, Professor Campbell. I mean, be very open. You're talking to someone who was heading to Europe on a first posting and then was heading to the South Pacific on a first posting. Both of those fell through and out of nowhere came for the first time in a very long time a position at a very junior level in Santiago. And um, I thought, why not? I knew nothing about Latin America, nothing. I've had four postings in this region, and this is my second in the region as ambassador, and it has been utterly fulfilling. And I agree with Noel, it's changed my life, and I wouldn't have done anything differently, but all because you must be open to uh, outside ideas and thinking outside the box. Um, I would also subscribe and tell people, no matter what you do, where you do it, be happy. If you're happy, you'll tend to do pretty well. And the other thing I would say is be very sincere in developing your relationships as a diplomat, because a lot of people uh, breeze around uh, cities where they're working, and it's very transactional. Why should I give you five minutes of my time, etc., etc.? But when you put the sincerity in and the, you know, you're um, prepared to commit to a relationship and to be sincere with somebody, uh, in this profession, in my opinion, that has tremendous rewards. So there, there's some of the things that I'd share. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And I can honestly say that it was a pleasure to host you today. Uh, I would like to introduce our guests to uh, my colleague, Danny Brown, from the International Strategy and Partnerships. And I believe that Danny would like to say a few words. He has been helping us from the background with the questions and talking to some of the attendees. Thanks, Ana Paula. I just wanted to thank the Brazilian Embassy and His Excellency Tim Kane for, for joining us and making this entire series uh, possible, not just today. Also, thank you to our other uh, panelists, Professor Wiseman and Noel Campbell. It's been a really, really interesting session. Um, I wanted to also thank the alumni who've, uh, who've been participating in, in this seminar series and, and today's in particular. And I noticed in the audience, there was a strong showing of the Canberra Diplomatic Corps um, and also, I just wanted to, to say, I notice also in the audience is a recent ANU graduate. And until this time last week, uh, a diplomat from the Brazilian embassy who was posted in Canberra, Romero Maia, welcome. Uh, good to see you and good to see you engaged in ANU and uh, Australian alumni events already. So if anybody has any further questions about um, ANU's Brazilian uh, strategy, please don't hesitate to get in contact with me. And if there are any people who are interested in perhaps uh, studying at the ANU, uh, please contact our fabulous host, Anna Paula. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the kind words, Danny. And I will thank again the presence of our panelists today. Professor uh, Wiseman, Professor Campbell, Ambassador Kane, and I'll, uh, we will meet again tomorrow 
that has everything to be another fantastic session. Thanks for joining us today.